Good evening. Uh, my name is Herb Moyer, and we're here at the Exeter TV studio, uh, ready to present with uh, Professor Barry Rock a um, third and final in this series program, and this one is on monitoring uh, forests from space. We've, uh, we've had two other programs in the past, and both of those programs are now available on the uh, Facebook page of the town of Exeter and through the um, New Hampshire Coalition for Community Media Telview server, so they can be downloaded to any community and broadcast uh, there. So with us tonight, and uh, Barry and I are both sporting our uh, national colors of Ukrainian, blue and yellow. We're sporting those colors in support of the uh, very sad situation in, in Europe. But uh, Professor Emeritus Barry Rock is a, uh, a co-chair of the UNH Writing Academy, and he's a Professor Emeritus in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. He received his BA in Botany from the University of Vermont and both his Master's and PhD degrees in Botany from the University of Maryland. Following the receipt of his doctorate, Dr. Rock held the positions of Assistant and Associate Professor of Biology at Alfred University in New York. And he became the botanist for the joint NASA Geosat remote sensing study conducted at Lost River, West Virginia in 1987. And then in 1987, I'm sorry, before that, in 1987, he joined the faculty at the University of New Hampshire as an associate professor of forest resources and the Institute for the Study of Earth, Ocean, and Space, what we know as EOS. Dr. Rock's research and publications have focused on remote sensing of vegetation, specifically on basic and applied research dealing with biophysical properties, pigment concentrations, anatom anatomical characteristics, and moisture content of leaves and their influence on reflectance features, which may be remotely detected. During the 1994-95 academic year, Dr. Rock assumed the position of senior scientist and assistant director of the GLOBE, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment Program, an environmental education outreach project directed from the White House. Dr. Rock developed the hands-on science activities to be conducted by GLOBE with students on an international scale with 26 participating countries involving more than 2,500 students. GLOBE was patterned after ideas presented by Al Gore in Earth in the Balance. So um, investigating the physiological and anatomical connections between poor air quality and leaf damage to forest species, primarily spruce, both Norway and red spruce, white pine and sugar maple. Connecting the spect spectral reflectance characteristics associated with the foliar damage as measured in the field and the lab with the capabilities of airborne hyperspectral and earth orbiting sensors, primarily Landsat thematic mapper, to detect, map, and monitor forest damage over wide areas. Dr. Rock helped create the series of K-12, uh, K-16, actually science outreach programs at UNH, the Forest Watch, Project Smart, and Maple Watch, and the Elizabeth City State University Watershed Watch, in addition to serving as the first chief scientist of GLOBE and an international K-12 education outreach program developed by the White House. So um, this whole series, um, which we called uh, Climate Change Justice for Future Generations, is the result of a generous grant by a uh, former um, living member of the Unitarian Universalist Church in Exeter. Uh, 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 her name was uh, Isabel uh, Locke and she was generous enough to give us the grant to start this program. So uh, we also have tonight uh, with us as a panelist, Matt Kelly, who's the extension forester with the Cheshire County Forestry Program 
in Keene. And we also have Eileen Flockhart, an Exeter resident, who will be joining us later. And she's on the committee for the trees in Exeter. And uh, she'll be sharing her expertise with you. So we have a couple of experts about trees and forests and Dr. Rock. And we hope you'll uh, think about some questions to ask later on the program. So we will shortly start the actual pre-recorded session that Dr. Rock gave about three weeks ago. Um, recording it so for, a few, for presentation now in conjunction with our panelists. Dr. Rock. Herb, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing from our viewers. Um, and uh, over our past two lectures, we've emphasized the importance of trees in terms of helping to control climate change by removing carbon dioxide and storing it as wood. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Good evening. Today, we want to talk about uh, how we monitor forests from space, and in particular, the health of the forest. And uh, I have spent uh, 30 years of my career learning how to do this. And so what I'll be showing you today is not kind of the state of the art, but it's how we develop the ability to do this. And um, it's really an amazing uh, capability. Here's our Earth. I start off showing this. Uh, you know, we can pick out things like clouds, but you can also see the vegetation belt here south of the Sahara Desert. This is Africa. You probably recognize that. Uh, you can also tell what time of year this image was taken because the southern hemisphere and the, the south polar regions are illuminated. So this is winter in the northern hemisphere, but it's summer in the southern hemisphere. And the beauty of this image is it's not just a pretty picture. There's data in there about all kinds of things. Um, I'd like to start off showing you uh, what I look like when I was 11 years old. Um, you see the arrow there pointing to a young boy, that's me, and my brother uh, Don and our dog Pal. I was a geek uh, from birth, I think. Uh, I loved space, I loved astronomy, I loved stargazing at the very earliest ages. And back in 1954, there was a show on television called Buzz Corey Space Patrol. And um, I actually won that space helmet in a competition at a grocery store. So uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, I dreamed of being an astronaut, but uh, that did not happen. However, I worked for seven years at the uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab, which is a NASA facility in Pasadena, California. And it is there that I learned to be able to monitor uh, vegetation from orbit. And I was called a geobotanical researcher. Uh, and geobotany is looking at the botany, the surface cover of uh, the landscape. And from the type of vegetation that's there, you can infer what the rock type is. So that's the whole idea of geobotany. Uh, and I branch from there into looking at the state of health or the lack of that. Uh, here I am um, using a spectrometer. We're going to be talking about a spectrometer in some detail today. Uh, and uh, this is out in Vasquez Rocks uh, in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I'm using this uh, sort of a portable uh, spectral reflectance spectrometer data. Um, and it's, it's not very portable, as you can see. It's got its brains in a big uh, case over here. Uh, the spectrometer is off here, just a little out of the photograph. Um, but we've come a long way. Now you can get a spectrometer like that that is about the size of your cell phone. So we've made uh, tremendous advances. Uh, while I was at JPL from 81 through 87, 
Uh, that was the same time that the space shuttle was earning its wings. And um, I got to know a number of the uh, astronauts that flew space shuttle. It turns out, as it says here, the workhorse of my research was the space shuttle Challenger. And each of the space shuttles had particular tools on board that were focused on geology, focused on vegetation, focused on urban development, and that sort of thing. And the Challenger had a lot of the equipment that I had helped develop. Um, while at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And it was exciting for me, that geeky little guy with a space helmet, to actually talk with astronauts. Whew. Those were heady days. Uh, here's uh, an example of the shuttle bay. This is Challenger. Over on its back, uh, bay doors are open, and you can see a um, device here that's got the JPL logo on it, on the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, this is a uh, radar device that is looking through clouds to look at vegetation on the ground. It turns out that uh, radar is one of the very few what are called remote sensing tools that can see through clouds. Um, by remote sensing, I mean learning something about something remotely. Uh, you're seeing me on a video. Uh, you're not in touch with me, but so you're sensing me remotely. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, sort of an overview of the science and the development of the science of uh, vegetation health remote sensing. I'll focus on uh, vegetation stress detection from orbit, and I will uh, discuss two studies that I've been involved in, one of them uh, an orbital study, but another training kindergarten through 12th grade students about science and having them learn science science by doing it. Um, for those of us in New England, you may never have thought of this, but New England is downwind from everyone in the country, and so you see at the bottom there it says New England, the tailpipe of the nation. We get everybody else's pollution, and so in, I mean, that's both good and bad. It's, it's bad in terms of our uh, air quality and, and breathing and that sort of thing, but if you're looking for stressed vegetation, especially stressed by air quality issues, New England is the place to be. Um, one of the things we learned from my research was that the, the worst air quality tends to be concentrated about 3,000 feet above the surface of the Earth. And uh, that came as a surprise. But in retrospect, it's then not a surprise that all of the very heavy forest damage uh, thought to be caused by acid rain is at elevation, tops of mountains. I use uh, polar orbiting satellites, meaning they go up and around the poles. Um, they make a pass in about an hour and s uh, about 60 minutes, um, and the Earth is rotating underneath as they're going over it, like so. And so they have a repeat coverage or a repeat cycle every 16 days. They go over the same spot on the ground. Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Burlington, Vermont, Los Angeles, Moscow, uh, every 16 days, a satellite is uh, clicking away and taking data for the ground passing below it. Um, you see some acronyms there. Uh, so TM stands for the thematic mapper. Uh, that's the sensor that I use primarily on the space shuttle as well as in permanent orbit. There's an enhanced thematic mapper, and then this is called the operational land imager. And these are all really the same instrument, but they've been developed over time. Uh, the beautiful part of Landsat is that it was first launched in 1978, and every 16 days has been going over your hometown. And uh, so we have this wonderful long-term data set of what the planet looked like back in 78, and then in the 80s, and then the 90s, the 2000s 
well, the 2010s, now the 2020s. I mean, what an incredible tool this is. You can watch change over time, both the damage that increases over time, as well as recovery when you figure out what the problem is. I introduced this in my last talk. This is the electromagnetic spectrum, and I want to point out some uh, features here. Um, right here at the top, uh, you see that this is an indication of whether um, information penetrates our atmosphere or not. Some places, the atmosphere is totally transparent. Other places, it's opaque, and the information, uh, we, we can't see it. So you can see at the longer wavelengths, the atmosphere is uh, transparent, but then we get to a point where it's not transparent. A uh, microwave does penetrate that, and that's what radar is. It's a microwave sensor. Um, a little further over, uh, this is where the visible light is, and it's right at a transparent part of our atmosphere. Uh, if you're wondering what these different uh, graphics are, these represent the size of the wavelength from peak to peak or trough to trough of uh, wavelength. And so in the visible, you can see it's about the size of microscopic organisms. Uh, you get out into the microwave, and you can see the wavelength distance is about six feet, about the size of a, a human. And you get out to the radio waves at very long wavelengths, and that's the size of skyscrapers. And these waves are all around us, and uh, we see the visible because our eyes are sensitive to that, but we don't see the radio waves, the television waves, the microwaves, don't see the infrared, et cetera. So it turns out that satellites are designed specifically to look in those atmospheric windows, those transparent parts of the spectrum, of the atmosphere, excuse me, using different spectral types. And this is uh, a slide I showed in the previous presentation as well, atmospheric transmission, and you see that window of light uh, where you have the highest peak, uh, and um, that's where visible light is. I mentioned uh, in the last presentation, this is also where plants are photosynthetic, and so they're taking advantage of this uh, transparent part of our atmosphere. Just to show you the size of some of these uh, satellites, some of them are the size of buses. They're huge. This one is kind of a, a medium-sized satellite. This is Landsat 7. It carried the enhanced thematic mapper. I talked about that just shortly ago. Uh, it was launched on tax day of 1999, and it's still operating today. It has three uh, visible bands. It has in their RGB, that's red, green, and blue. Um, three infrared bands, near infrared band four, shortwave uh, infrared bands at five and seven. We'll talk more about that shortly, uh, et cetera. Uh, it also has a black and white band called a panchromatic band, and that uh, is a 15 meter pixel. The other pixels are all 30 meters on a side, and to give you a sense of the size of a 30 meter pixel, it's about the size of a baseball diamond. I think we're all familiar with that. Here's Landsat 7 in orbit. Uh, the feature over here on the side, are, those are solar panels, and then the thematic mapper simulator is looking down and tracking whatever is going under uh, Landsat as it passes over. This is Landsat 8. You can see it's a little bit smaller. Uh, the, the beauty of technology and all of the electronics getting smaller and smaller. We showed this in the last presentation as well, showing um, clouds coming from transpiration in uh, trees below it. This is the Amazon region. And I show this once again because this is a Landsat 7 image. It uh, gives you an idea of uh, the quality of the image. Let's talk about uh, deforestation. This is a big issue. 
especially in the Amazon. This is an area in Brazil called the Mato Grosso region. Uh, it's in the heart of the Amazon. Um, down here in the lower left-hand corner, you see this is a Landsat image from uh, June 17th uh, in 2002, and then boom, here it is in 2006, just four years later, and I'll just click between these. 2002, 2006, 2002, 2006, and then the computer can tell us what areas were deforested between 2002 and 2006, and we're doing this around the world. Um, there was a time when a lot of the deforestation in the Amazon uh, we didn't know about because it was very remote. Now we're passing over it every 16 days with uh, these wonderful satellites. So another example, this is an area called the uh, Madre de Dios, the Mother of God Amazon region. Uh, it's in Peru, it's on the eastern slopes of the Andes in Peru, and it extends then into the Amazon basin. And uh, what we see here would be in 1984, this is the same area that we see here in 2016. Uh, no deforestation here. These light areas are massive regions of deforestation and it's not to sell the wood, it's to get the wood out of the way so that uh, the uh, people living there uh, can illegally mine gold. And that gold has uh, come from the slopes of the Andes. It's down in the Amazon basin in the soil. You gotta get rid of the trees to get at the soil. And they use placer mining, uh, very high pressure water sprayed on the sediments and then they collect the gold. Um, so you see at the bottom there, the question is, when did that illegal gold mining begin? And this shows you that repeat coverage, the value of the repeat coverage, uh, being able to see what things looked like in 84, but then also what uh, happened by 2016. However, this is just a close-up uh, of those deforested areas. This is 2016, but it's going on today. Um, and this whole area has been deforested. Here we see 2006. The question is, when did that illegal gold mining begin? This is 2006. This is 2007, and you can see up here just the very beginning of the deforestation. I'll click back. There's 2006, you don't see it at all. There's 2007. Uh, you notice the, the river is wandering around a bit just because of heavy mud flow and sedimentation. This is a very level area. Here's 2008, boom. This corresponds to the economic collapse that was global. And so we can see how things going on at a global level end up impacting uh, the Amazon basin in uh, Brazil, but also in um, Peru. One of the tools that I've used is like that spectrometer you saw back when I was at JPL. Uh, we end up calling this the virus. It stands, it's an acronym for Visible Infrared Intelligence Spectrometer. Uh, you can see people's eyebrows raise when you tell them you're bringing a virus into uh, uh, their forest to look at their trees. They're at first a little concerned. But this does a beautiful job of creating spectral signatures, spectral fingerprints, if you will, uh, both healthy and damaged forest species, deciduous and evergreen. Uh, this is a virus reflectance curve, and uh, we saw this in the last presentation, but uh, you can see here in the visible, this is the blue portion of the spectrum, strongly absorbed by photosynthesis, by chlorophyll, uh, a little modest green peak, here's a, a red well also, and then this sharp rise up onto the near infrared is called the red edge, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, you can see you go out further. Uh, this is all now in the infrared. We've left uh, the visible. This is the near infrared and then the short wave infrared. You see at the top, the features in the leaves 
that those wavelengths tell you something about the leaf pigments, chlorophylls, carotene, xanthophylls, anthocyanins, all kinds of pigments. Uh, you can see that in the spectral signature. Out here in the, uh, uh, in the, the near infrared, uh, you're seeing cell structure and the changes in cell structure caused in uh, many cases by air pollution. And if you go further out, then we're looking at leaf water content. And as I said in the last presentation, if you can get information about uh, chlorophyll concentrations and leaf structure and health and water content uh, for a botanist, this is a gold mine. And the satellite was designed specifically to see these features. I uh, showed this the last time as well. Um, you see the difference between healthy and damaged uh, vegetation. These are conifers in this case. These are data collected in the Czech Republic, uh, looking at uh, acid rain damage there. We see the red edge slipping up here. And as I mentioned before, my career has been built around understanding what the red edge can tell us about chlorophyll concentrations. Um, these are examples of needles that show um, healthy needles. These are the, the first year needles. They're over here. You may not think of this, but this is an archive of needles over maybe eight or 10 years. You've got new needles produced here, and then these would be second year needles, these would be third year needles, fourth year needles, fifth year needles, sixth year needles, seventh year needles, et cetera. And so if you wanna look at the, the way the tree is behaving over uh, a, a number of years, you can do that with a spectrometer. You can see it with your eyes as well. You can see that the older needles are for the most part chlorotic, meaning yellow, that means they are lo losing their chlorophyll. Just want to show you how we can calculate uh, that red edge position. We end up doing something called a first derivative, and then we look to see what the first derivative wavelength is. And in uh, what we're showing you are um, essentially the red edge region from the chlorophyll well to the um, uh, highly reflective near infrared region. And um, the lighter lines are from uh, trees that are in uh, essentially a low damage site and then trees in a high damage site. Those are the heavier lines. And so we can see that down here, uh, the peak of uh, this red edge inflection point for low damage trees is at 720 nanometers. And when we then get the peak here for the healthier trees, um, you'll see changes. And this will give you the wavelength values. And that uh, REIP, we pronounce that as REAP, and that stands for the red edge inflection point. We mentioned uh, in the last presentation that if you plot the red edge inflection point along the horizontal axis against chlorophyll concentration along the vertical axis, you can see there's a very good correspondence. The longer the red edge inflection point, the more chlorophyll and uh, the lower uh, wavelength positions of the red edge inflection point, the, the loss of chlorophyll. So there, more chlorophyll, less chlorophyll. NASA has a whole series of satellites they call the A-Train. The A stands for afternoon. These are afternoon overpasses, and each of these satellites is only minutes apart from one another, and they're all in the same orbit. And the reason for doing that is to get coverage of one point on the ground by, say, five or six different satellites over the course of an hour. 
So it's almost simultaneous collection of the data. Um, I don't show uh, Landsat up here, but um, this is a satellite is the size of a bus. It's called Aqua. Uh, that study water conditions. Here's Aura over here, a similar bus size satellite, studies the atmosphere. A parasol looks at uh, aerosols in the atmosphere. Calypso is looking at uh, water quality issues, et cetera. So an incredible set of information provided on uh, essentially daily or every other day coverage. This is a Landsat thematic mapper image of Vermont. And uh, so you can see, I'll just point out uh, Lake Champlain over here. This is the Burlington area. This is uh, I-89 over to Waterbury, Vermont, et cetera. Uh, the colors here show where the conifers are, and then below them, the, the broadleaf species. These are developed areas in pink. Uh, the Connecticut River is winding its way over here. This would be Mount Musilock in uh, New Hampshire. Don't quite get over to Mount Washington, but uh, these are the White Mountains, and of course, this is the Green Mountain mountain chain in Vermont. We can also see temperature. Uh, you and I can't see temperature. We can feel it, but we can't see it. And um, that is uh, incredibly valuable. This is from that aqua sensor that I, I mentioned. And we can see on April 9th through the 11th in 2017 that you have cooler water here in the Gulf of Mexico, and you've got a big burst of very warm water uh, from, coming from the Caribbean Sea. And this affects the migration patterns of all kinds of marine animals. And we can see that from orbit. Uh, you couldn't have enough ships to cover this area daily or every other day to get these kind of changes. Uh, it, it wouldn't be possible without the use of satellites. Uh, my sampling strategy is to um, uh, start off with a tree, collect a branch, uh, preferably first year needles and third year needles, then make a thin section with a razor blade. It's actually done in a laboratory with a tool called a microtome, but can be done in the field with a razor blade. And then we are able to look at the uh, cell structure of the needles in cross section. And here they come. We've got healthy on the left-hand side, damaged needles on the right, um, and different uh, tissues being labeled. You've got the epidermis, the hypodermis, the central uh, vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem that we mentioned the last time. And then right in the middle is where the tree makes all of its sugars, and that's the mesophyll. And if you just compare the two, uh, the damaged uh, needle, you can see that the mesophyll is very heavily impacted. And this looks like uh, perhaps the lung tissue of a smoker who smokes a pack and a half a day. Uh, these are dead cells in the damage. And it, uh, we can record the spectrometer uh, reflectance of those dead cells. And then using orbital sensors, we can map the areas where these dead cells, damaged cells are. I want to talk about the camel's hump study. I'm a Vermonter, and I used to hike camel's hump with uh, my dad. Uh, you can see camel's hump here. I think you would agree that it looks sort of like a camel's hump. Um, and uh, it turns out that in the 1980s, uh, camel's hump became the poster child for uh, acid rain damage here in the United States. This is from the summit of Camel's Hump, and you can see uh, the chlorosis, the yellowing here. You can see some dead trees. Uh, what we're looking at is red spruce, Picea rubens. Um, this is a close-up with some healthy needles, but then some unhealthy needles as well. 
Uh, this is that Landsat image that we saw before. This is where Camel Sump is located, just south of Route 89, if you're going from Waterbury to Burlington, Vermont. Um, if you travel that ever, uh, it's a beautiful thing to look up and see Camel Sump. So this is just a close-up. You can see the dark areas. Those are the conifers, and uh, that's where we're looking at acid rain damage. Um, because the satellite passes over the area every 16 days, and the satellite can't see through clouds, uh, chances are pretty good when you assemble a team of 30 or 40 students and researchers and equipment and that sort of thing and get up on camel's hump, that 16th day overpass is going to be cloudy. So NASA supplies a, a C-130 aircraft. Uh, this is at the Burlington Airport. And in the belly of the aircraft are sensors like the thematic mapper, but they're called thematic mapper simulators. And uh, so we can fly when the weather's good. And you would really love to have a nice bluebird day. Uh, this is a picture of the same virus. I'm including that just because this tells us that on Camel's Hump, we're looking at upper elevation sites at about 3,000 feet. Remember, that's uh, where the atmospheric sewer is, unfortunately. And then just below that, at 2,800 feet. So just below that uh, large amount of air pollution concentrated in that uh, region above 3,000 feet. We saw this uh, the last time, uh, the healthy signature, spectral fingerprint, and the damaged. And what we'd really like to do is be able to see the damage before the leaves turn yellow. So this is an indication of macroscopic damage where you can see the yellowing, but if we're really lucky, we'll be able to look at microscopic changes and then metabolic changes from the standpoint of uh, metabolism within the tree and tell us uh, pre-visually what is uh, damaged, the onset of the damage. And we've actually been able to do that. Very exciting. Uh, one of the first things we did was make thin sections of the needles above 3,000 feet and then below 3,000 feet. And so uh, in A, we're seeing a cross section of a spruce needle, red spruce. It's uh, located at uh, 2,800 feet, so just below that atmospheric sewer. And down here, we're looking at needles the same age. Uh, needles, first year needles, um, up in that atmospheric sewer at 3,100 feet elevation. And um, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to see that here we see chloroplasts, we see clear vacuoles, uh, the cell walls are fairly thin, and uh, here we see nothing but uh, the vacuole stained with tannins. Uh, the tannins, uh, you may have had those this morning if you drink coffee or tea. Uh, they're soluble, water-soluble um, pigments, and they have a spectral signature that we can pick out. You also see that the vacuoles have kind of pulled away from the cell walls here, and the cell walls are thicker, and they're actually wrinkled. They're swollen, and we know what causes that. So this is the reflectance curve. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is to be able to use Landsat data to map where you see these spectral differences. And what we did was we created something called a moisture stress index, or MSI, and uh, band four uh, is over here, and the reflectance of a healthy uh, set of needles is at about this point, about 60% reflectant. And then you get out into band five, this is where the water content information is. It's much lower, but about 30%. And if you ratio band five over band four, 
Uh, that becomes the moisture stress index, and you see it in the graphic here. You see the MSI, the moisture stress index. Just very subtle differences in terms of the uh, values. Here we see for the damaged, it's only about 35% reflectant uh, at the top of the infrared plateau, and 20%. Uh, Remember, we said that this, this region in the near infrared indicates cell structure. And so this change, this very dramatic drop in reflectance is an indication of the cell damage that I showed you microscopically. So it's, um, it's wonderful what these spectrometers can do. And then if you put that moisture stress index, the band five over band four in the red color gun of a computer, that maps where the damage is. And this is just beautiful. This is camel's hump, this is the upper summit, and then a, a lower summit that we call the rump of the hump. And uh, it's on the west side of the mountains. This is where the damage is. Um, we can see that on the ground, but no one had ever mapped that before, from, uh, especially from orbit. Uh, you can see the red areas where the moisture stress index value is very low. Um, the normal healthy trees are down here. These are uh, not conifers. These are broadleaf trees, mostly birch and maple. This is all red spruce, and there's all red spruce on the other side of the mountain as well. Um, this is the ridge of the Green Mountains. You can see the red damage is on the west side, and the same trees are over here, but no damage on the east side of the mountains. And also, if you put a topographic map here, this is that 3,000-foot mark. And we didn't know any of this before we did this study. So uh, conclusions there are that uh, remote sensing data, the thematic mapper, especially that pan five over four ratio, the moisture stress index, can be used to detect spectral symptoms of forest damage from aircraft and also from orbit. This approach has identified damage only on the west side of the, the mountain, Camel Sump, and others to the south and to the north. Same is true on Mount Mansfield, which is uh, further to the north. And it's distinctly above 3,000 feet, so it's in the atmospheric sewer. The trees that are not in the sewer are not damaged. Uh, laboratory studies identified uh, the cellular and spectral evidence of foliar acid rain damage. You get loss of chloroplasts, plasmolysis of cells, shrinking of the cell contents, vacular tannins, the five over four ratio change. And then other studies on Mount Musilock here in New Hampshire, uh, I was able to determine that it's not acid rain damage, but rather um, it's coming from uh, low level ozone exposure. And um, so we ended up learning all kinds of amazing things with this study. Now I wanna talk about the K through 12 project. Called it Forest Watch, began in 1991. I left the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab in 87, uh, came to um, University of New Hampshire, and uh, within three or four years I had uh, proposed to develop this K through 12 program. Uh, through the National Science Foundation, and it was funded, funded in 1990, and so it actually began in 91. And here we're looking at white pine. Turns out white pine is very sensitive to ground level ozone. Remember I said that in the Camel Sump study, we had actually identified the ground level ozone as the major causal of uh, what was called acid rain damage, but it, it wasn't acid rain damage at all. Okay, so. Here were the first uh, schools uh, in 91. Uh, we ended up having three, uh, excuse me, two uh, high schools, two middle schools, and two primary grade schools. And by the time our program was in full swing, 
we had over 360 schools that were involved. I mean, it's amazing. All across New England, um, I don't show it, but they were in the Adirondacks of New York on Long Island, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania. It was an amazingly successful program. The ground level ozone, if you're wondering where that comes from, it comes from our tailpipes. Um, the NOx here stands for nitrogen oxides. The VOC is volatile organic compounds. And in the forests, a lot of those volatile organic compounds come from the trees. If you think of walking in a nice pine woods, you can smell the volatile organic compounds coming from those trees. <coughs> in the presence of sunlight and then high temperature, anything above 85 degrees, the NOx plus the VOX gives us ozone. And this is at the ground level where you and I live. It's also concentrated in that atmospheric sewer above um, 3,000 feet. White pine is a good bioindicator uh, for ground level ozone. We call that smog. Uh, very common in New England. Every schoolyard has a white pine or two or five or maybe a hundred right outside their door, uh, which is great. Uh, schools don't have to get parental permission and arrange school buses to go somewhere. They can just go out their front door and find white pine growing. White pine retains its foliage year round, and of course, the school year is from September to June. And uh, so if you were wanting to study, um, have your students study maple, uh, it doesn't have leaves when you want them to study it. So uh, white pine was just perfect. Show some white pine outside of a particular school, San Bonnie's here in New Hampshire. Um, kids get really excited about this. This is hands-on science. Uh, they're learning new things all of the time. Um, you see some field trips, uh, very local, just outside the school. These kids are holding pruning poles where they can put them together and get up into the canopy and collect samples. The whole idea behind Forest Watch was have the students collect samples every year from the same, same uh, white pine trees and um, look for the evidence of ground level ozone, yellow spots and uh, dead tips to the needles. You can go outside and do that uh, after we're done talking here if you'd like. Um, and just count up the number of yellow spots, the chlorotic areas, and then the dead tips, tip necrosis, and report that back to me from their, the samples they've collected, <coughs> they end up uh, keeping half for themselves and then they take the other half and they ship them to me in little uh, pony coolers, uh, put a six pack in there, but you can also put samples of white pine needles and I'll look at those pine needles they've sent me with the virus and then I can compare the spectral signatures of their needles. If they're healthy, that's great. If they're damaged, uh, that is also useful information. And compare that with the student data they get from just counting the number of chlorotic model points. And most kids, when they think of a conifer, they think it's a pine tree. And of course, they learn that pines, no, they're a very particular kind of a conifer, different from spruce, different from hemlock, different from fir, et cetera. So it was a wonderful learning experience. And then, of course, one thing over here you see is a handful of male pine cones. And I would imagine most of you may not realize that there are male cones. And when we see a cone, uh, a large one, that's a female cone. 
So here's just showing us uh, white pine branches cut from trees. They then collect the needles and bring them in. Look at the fascicles, that's the bunch of five needles. It turns out that there are five uh, letters in the word white, and white pine has five needles in a fascicle. So nice mnemonic device to remember them. Then uh, they take a look, and here's that yellow spot, that chlorotic model that I mentioned. Here's some of the dead tips, the necrotic tips. There's a chlorotic model. Here's the tip necrosis. And then you see these little fine white lines. Those are rows of stomates. And here's what they look like. This uh, photograph was taken by a student. And remember the stomates, uh, you have oxygen from photosynthesis, water, the evapotranspiration, and then volatile organics, the resins that smell like pines, and going in would be the carbon dioxide, and unfortunately ozone and other atmospheric pollutants. These are sections made by students. Uh, you can see at the top there uh, the tip necrosis, the dead needles. There is no greenness over here, no chlorophyll. This is a nice healthy part. And then if you make a section through a chlorotic model, part of it will be yellow, but part of it will be green. Turns out that uh, pine needles in a cluster, the fascicle, uh, the outer uh, side of the triangle of each needle is non-stomatal, no stomates there, uh, stomates on the two inner sides, and uh, so students could actually compare what they see with their microscopes uh, with the stomatal side and identify it as ozone damage. Just showing you stomates and no stomates. And again, this is a student-made section made with a razor blade. Turns out that ozone can be especially, ground level ozone can be especially bad uh, along coastal areas on a really nice hot summer day. Uh, at the time you want to be at the beach, uh, it's unfortunately not good for your lungs, but um, it improves your mental attitude, I guess. It turns out that uh, the areas that are nice and green are up here in the whites. Um, and this is all uh, fairly uh, high damage ozone. Um, the value of learning all of this in the classroom is uh, students are making measurements, they're using a microscope, they're learning plant anatomy. Who knew an inside of a pine needle had cells? Um, they have to analyze their data, they do graphic, they do an incredible amount of uh, critical thinking, and uh, what they end up doing is they end up learning science by doing it. And um, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that these needles look healthy, these do not, but getting to know the pine needle inside and out uh, is an incredible experience. And it turns out that many of my graduate students at the University of New Hampshire started off as Forest Watch students in the 90s and then came in the 2000s. I've got four different PhD uh, students, but they're now PhDs teaching at Penn State, at Ohio State, out in uh, UCLA. And they started off their interest in science in Forest Watch. Um, this is more information than we need, but again, you see the healthy and the damage, the fact that I'm measuring their samples with the virus and they're doing counts in the lab and comparing results. They learn about uh, chlorophyll and its value, uh, the water content. They measure wet, wet weight, uh, dry weight of their needles, et cetera. And the really good news is this program ran from 91 through 2014 
And what we see here is a plot of ozone values. The dotted lines are the ozone values. They were high in 91. Thanks to the Clean Air Act, they have dropped. There are some higher points, but not nearly as high as they were in 1991. And you know, here they are over in 2010. Uh, the ozone levels have dropped. This is the red edge inflection point value, the health of the pine needles. And when the ozone levels were high, the pine needles were damaged, a large percentage damaged. As the ozone levels dropped, look at what happened. We now have much healthier pine trees. And it's because of that Clean Air Act that got a lot of the ozone out of the atmosphere. So the students actually contributed in a very meaningful way to this study. So lessons learned, white pine first year needles are sensitive uh, and they're a bioindicator for a ground level ozone. And I've got too many M's in summer, I see. Uh, during high ozone summers, the first year needles of pine, the chlorophyll levels are low, chlorotic model, tip necrosis, et cetera. During low ozone summers, the first year needles on the same trees, new needles, but the same trees. Chlorophyll levels are high, chlorotic model, and no tip necrosis, just missing. The red edge inflection point values are inversely related to the summer ozone levels. Uh, and K through 12 student data match very well with my laboratory and field spectral data. And so the bottom line is the K through 12 students are capable of doing incredible things. And I'd like to think I'm turning them into little Loraxes, speaking for the trees. Um, and they've, they've just learned so much and they provided me with incredibly valuable data and some of my best colleagues during that period from 91 through uh, 2014 were the teachers. Uh, you'd be amazed how empowered teachers are when they get to do some real science and to contribute to the process of doing science and then the reporting of doing science. I've had uh, Forest Watch students go to international science meetings and um, two things happen. It turns out that the students at the meetings never realized there were so many scientists in the world. And the scientists come over and gather around their poster, seeing that these are sixth grade students or high school students. We even had some pre-K students at an international meeting. Uh, just incredible, incredible stuff. So I want to thank you. Um, hopefully this wasn't uh, too much scientific detail. I think it's important that you realize that it's not just what we think we see. Science allows us to know what we see and to know what the results are. And the bottom line here is we got to let the trees do their job. And by knowing science, you're finding out what the job of the trees is. And uh, we're going to talk more about that in our next presentation. We're going to look at the impact of climate change on forests, in this case, around the Northern Hemisphere, and also the politics. Um, back in 91, politics were very different than they are today. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then what that means for the future. And the future really depends on us letting the trees do their job. So thank you. So um, you probably learned more than you ever realized you'd learn about uh, <laughs> monitoring various uh, parameters of forests from, from space. 
Um, so we're back live with uh, Professor Barry Rock. And before we uh, bring on uh, Matt Kelly from the uh, Cheshire County Extension Forestry Program and uh, Eileen Flockhart from the Exeter Tree Committee, I just want to uh, go over a couple of points with uh, Professor Rock. Um, <clears throat> How are ozone levels measured? What, what's the technique for measuring ozone? Uh, the state measures those. Um, the EPA measures those. <clears throat> and they are called ozone monitoring towers. Okay. And I wish I knew what the technology or the techniques were. I do not. No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Um, is, is the monitoring of forest health and sustainability continuing? I know you're probably not still involved directly, but is it generically still continuing elsewhere? I wish there were. Um, I get emails from former Forest Watch teachers, oh, maybe once or twice a month, uh -huh. asking, can we bring Forest Watch back? Uh, there are 12 schools that continue doing Forest Watch and I'm, I'm no longer part of that, which is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, ideally, one would like to kind of lay the groundwork and then have others pick it up and run with it. And so there are 12 schools. Uh, there are three in New Hampshire, four in Maine. Uh, the remainder are in Connecticut and Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. I left out Vermont. How could I? <laughs> how could I leave out Vermont? There are two schools, uh, one in Burlington, one in Montpelier, that continue to do this. Uh, the concept of monitoring uh, natural resources from space certainly has ap applicability in a lot of different fields. Uh, clearly, we're using these sensors to monitor. Uh, ice pack and ice flows mm -hmm. and various levels of uh, polar ice. Um, I guess it would be useful also for studying archaeology. So various sites in uh, prehistoric times or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, in fact, there are some good examples of that in Mexico. Right. Uh, looking at ancient Mayan ruins um, and finding ru uh, Mayan ruins that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Because from 500 miles up, you see all of the Yucatan at once. Right. And um, we were able to develop uh, forest health uh, indicators for tropical woodlands uh -huh. in the Yucatan. And as a result of that work, uh, there are four or five new sets of ruins that were, were unknown, yeah. but detected from orbit using these techniques. If I remember correctly, there was a, um, a major asteroid hit somewhere around the Yucatan, and it was shown from spatial photographs. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That was uh, the northern part, if we think of the Yucatan as being kind of like a thumb, I'll yeah. do it this way. Yeah. Um, in this area is where that uh, either a meteor or an asteroid yeah. hit. It's an area known as the Chicxulub region. Mm. And um, it turns out that you can see some of the evidence on the land mass. Should hold it up like this. Uh, but a large part of that impact was in uh, essentially the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, you can see patterns in wave action and circulation that fit beautifully with the uh, crater rim and, oh. and that sort of thing. Interesting. 65 million years ago. <laughs> wow. Um, I think that exhausts our questions here. I don't see any coming from uh, people who zoomed in. Um, so I think we'll go to uh, Matt Kelly, the uh, Cheshire County Extension Forester. Hi, Matt. Hi, how are you? We're all well. Good to see you. Good. Thanks for having me here. That was a really informative, enjoyable presentation that Dr. Rock gave. Um, 
glad to see uh, such a emphasis on remote sensing because that's a, a field that has really become important in the world of forestry and natural resource management by the practitioners who, who need to understand how that information is obtained and can be used in a, in a practical sense. So I appreciate the presentation. Great. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, so I've prepared just a short presentation. Uh, let's make sure. Is that coming through okay? Yeah, we see that. Great. Um, and so uh, what I want to talk about tonight briefly in the short time I have is forest carbon and climate smart forestry in New Hampshire. Um, one of the areas that we're seeing increased interest is in um, understanding the dynamics of, of carbon and how they flow through forests, how forests can help to mitigate um, climate change by, by sequestering carbon, but also how forests are being affected by climate change in terms of changing conditions and um, that I'll just so interject I just interject sure. describe sequestering what that means I will definitely get to that and, and compare it to storage but I, I just want to go through a few things but sequestering real and real quick is is the rate of removal of carbon from the atmosphere um, into forests um, different forest carbon pools it being above ground below ground dead wood etc yeah thanks sure Okay. Uh, so first, before we get into sort of managing for forest carbon, I'd like to emphasize sort of who owns New Hampshire's forests, because um, it really matters in the sense of these are the people who are making decisions about our forest resources. And the real bottom line here is that the majority of, of the forest land in New Hampshire are owned by private individuals or families who can own as little as one or two acres, upwards to, to thousands of acres. And as a group, those, those owners have a really diverse set of management objectives and interests, um, and carbon might be one of them, it might not be. Um, so some of the public policies and politics around incentivizing um, forest carbon management are really important at reaching these, these landowners. Um, so I just wanna jump in a little bit with some data. Um, the, the, the bottom line here is that the current state of New Hampshire's forests indicate that we are a carbon sink as opposed to a carbon source, meaning that we're, we're taking in more carbon from the atmosphere than our forests are emitting. Um, so what we see here on the leftmost uh, chart, the, the total forest carbon sequestration from 2018 data, um, we're at about 5.2 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent um, being sequestered. And in, in the chart, I've highlighted New Hampshire as red. And you can see that New York and Maine have larger totals. They're, they're simply bigger states. Um, if you look at that on a per acre average, this middle chart, um, that translates to uh, 1.1 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per acre per year. Um, and then if you think about that sequestration uh, relative to how much we are emitting in our state of greenhouse gas emissions, um, that amount of sequestration that our forests are doing for us um, offsets about 33% of our total annual emissions, which is, which is really good on a national level that number is about 15% of all forests in the U U.S. Um, sequester or offset the, the emissions that occur throughout the nation. Another way of thinking about you know, carbon and you know, being a carbon sink versus a carbon source is a, a really simple way of looking at the forest, which is the growth to harvest ratio. So this is data that the U.S. Forest Service collects and, and puts out. Um, and so in, in New Hampshire, um, we have a, a pretty healthy growth to harvest ratio of 2.0. And that means we're, we're essentially growing twice as much wood as we're, as we're removing through timber harvest. Um, that translates to about a half a cord per acre of year in growth um, and about a quarter of a cord per acre in harvested material. Um, so as promised, here's my slide on carbon storage versus carbon sequestration. And it's really important to distinguish between these two concepts 
um, because they peak at different times in stand development. So carbon storage is simply the amount of carbon at a given time. So if I go out behind my house and measure the woodlot back there um, and, and take that data and, and calculate the amount of carbon, that would be the, the carbon storage that I have currently in the backwoods. Uh, sequestration is the rate of carbon removed through photosynthesis over a period of time. You typically think of it in, in terms of a year. Um, and why that's important is that carbon storage generally peaks, is maximized when forests are in their older age condition, so around 200 years or thereabouts. Um, in contrast, carbon sequestration is optimized when young forests are growing really fast and are in high competition with each other. So the sequestration rate is maximized typically when the stand is around 25 upwards to 50 years old. Uh, and this is what that looks like um, in terms of a diagram looking at a, a timeline. So you might start with some major disturbance, be it fire, hurricane, um, timber harvest, uh, that, that stand is regenerated. And then it goes through this, this growth period, which we call the stem exclusion phase. And this is the period where these trees are in high competition with each other, they're really dense, and they're growing at fast rates. So the sequestration rate is maximized during this phase as opposed to these older age um, forest types where storage, you have large trees and then therefore storage is maximized. So when we think about strategies about managing forests and thinking about forests in terms of climate change, um, mitigating the impacts, one of the first things that, that I think of is just simply keeping forests as forests. Uh, this relates to to Dr. Rock's uh, um, presentation regarding um, how do we know, you know how much forest is being lost? Well, depending on certain um, you know, reports, it's between, we're losing between 3,000 and 13,000 acres of forest um, to non-forest use in New Hampshire each year. And by non-forest use, I mean development, um, housing units, um, buildings, commercial buildings, that kind of thing, and maybe even some agriculture. To put it in more specific terms, from 2010 to 2018, um, both Cheshire County and Rockingham County lost about 1,000 acres. Um, from the, the study that this data comes from, they uh, project that at the current rate of forest loss, which is about 0.27% per year, in the next 50 years, um, we can see upwards to 640,000 acres of forest converted to non-forest use. And so the implications from a, a forest carbon perspective is once that forest is converted, it can never, you know, uh, sequester um, carbon uh, in the way it had before, except for maybe some ornamental trees or some urban trees. And so really the role of land trusts, conservation easements, land conservancies are, are real important to, to making sure that these things happen. The second strategy that a lot of people in the forestry and natural resource community are talking about are, is, is managing for resiliency. And really what we're trying to do is mitigate the risk of large scale tree mortality and therefore carbon loss. And we know that happens through different modes, um, one being insects and disease, both native and non-native. Um, and another one could be through extreme weather events, be it drought, fire, hurricane, ice storm. And we know um, or, or we understand that the climate change projections are telling us that these extreme weather events can happen with more frequency and more severity. Um, so we want to think about ways to increase resiliency of our forests to, to withstand and adapt to these, these stressors. One way of doing that is through increase, making sure we have a, an increased species diversity. Um, so as opposed to growing a plantation forest of exclusively red pine or Norway spruce, um, which will grow very fast and, and increase carbon storage over many years. That monoculture is, is not resilient, especially if there is um, something like the red pine scale that will attack that specific species and, and wipe out that stand. Um, we also want to think about greater age class diversity, having, having some old growth forests, uh, and, but also some younger stands. In case of those large scale events like a hurricane that blows over mostly the large trees, 
we have some of those younger stands that are ready to, to shoot up into the upper canopy. Um, one thing to think about also in terms of, of climate change is the habitat suitability given these changing conditions to the species that we currently have in the state and also species that might be just south of us. So I won't go through this table on the right, um, but there's been a lot of work done to look at um, different tree species and its anticipated response to different climate change scenarios. Some will decline, um, some will you know, be more readily suitable for our area, um, and some will have very little change. Uh, a third strategy, and this really gets into more um, traditional forestry, is, is simply increasing the growth rate within the stands that we're, we're managing or, or overseeing. And we can do that by thinning these intermediate age stands that increases the, the light and resources and, and, and optimizes growth on your, your best and healthiest trees. And so by doing that, those remaining trees will increase their growth rate. And ideally you're removing the trees that are less healthy, less vigorous. Um, and so in the short term that reduces carbon stocks, but um, those trees that were removed or harvested um, may not have survived because of their position in the canopy, um, because of defects, because of um, signs of, of stress. So those are the trees we want to remove first. If those trees can then be converted into durable wood products like boards or dimension lumber, those products continue to store carbon well into the future um, and even beyond their, their useful life. Once they're in a, a landfill, they can continue to store carbon. Then finally, um, a strategy would be to balance both storage and sequestration. So in terms of storage, we can think about extending our rotation age, how long, how old we grow our trees to before we decide to harvest them, or maybe never harvest um, some of those trees and just let them grow um, until, until their natural mortality occurs. Um, we can think about managing a multi-age or uneven age uh, a stand or approach to management. And so therefore you're having a mix of old trees, young trees. And so you're getting that balance of storage and sequestration. Ideally, if we're gonna be managing and trying to steward a stand, we wanna make sure that we're, we're ending up with, with harvested products that can be durable wood products as opposed to um, paper and pulp. Those durable wood products continue to store carbon into the future. And certainly we can have areas across the state that we just set aside for preserves that are not managed. Maybe they, there's some old growth or some um, really uh, important areas or, or hard to operate on areas that we just set aside and let those, and let nature take its course and let those continue to store carbon well into the future. And then of course, as every good forester, we wanna make sure that if there is a disturbance or after harvest that there's prompt regeneration so that we get the next forest growing for future uh, generations. Um, that's really the brief overview. There, this is a really big topic and there's a lot of things to cover. I haven't touched on forest carbon markets where we're trying to incentivize private landowners. We really haven't talked about vulnerability of forest types. Um, the, the other thing to think about is there's an economic reality. So there's a demand for forest products so even if your approach is to keep it forever wild and never harvest, that might not really shift the, the carbon accounting because the demand for forest products might just shift that, that harvesting activity to another property or another state or even another country. Um, and finally, substituting wood products for less carbon friendly materials. So there's a real push right now with these large wood um, wood structures to replace steel, concrete, and of course, plastic. Um, I'll leave you with some resources. The one that I'll point out that I've been involved in is the Securing Northeast Forest Carbon Pro Program. Um, you can go to that website, northeastforestcarbon.org. It really serves as a clearinghouse for a lot of other resources and really good information, all things forest carbon and forest carbon markets. And of course, you can contact um, your Extension Foresters, myself, um, my contact information is here, um, or the, the extension forester for Rockingham County is Greg Jordan, um, who couldn't join us tonight. Um, but I'm sure if you have more questions about forced carbon or management, 
um, you can contact either one of us and we can connect you to the resources um, that would help you in answering your questions. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and pass it back over. I started my uh, career in forestry at UNH and switched to biology later. <laughs> uh, Eileen, are you there? No, maybe not. I, I wanted to uh, get back to you, Barry, uh, Professor Rock. Um, you, you showed that research at uh, Camel's Hump, showing the damage level at 3,000 feet. Yep. In uh, 2003, I spent uh, 12 weeks in the Czech Republic hmm. with a couple of Charles University oh, scientists yeah. doing research on acid rain there. And what they found was really, uh, that okay. uh, 3,000 foot level, I'll be right there, Eileen, thank you. That 3,000 okay. foot level, not only did you have damage, but people had lung diseases at a much higher rate oh, yes. at that level, so because yeah. of the yeah. sulfur and nitrous oxides and so forth. The atmospheric sewer. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Hello, Eileen. Hi, Herb, how are you? Um, we're well here. Thank you very much for joining us. Eileen's on the Exeter Tree Committee and is going to give us a short presentation of the work that they do there. And maybe you know if it's being mirrored in other communities or not, Eileen, I don't know. Oh, I think there are a number of um, towns from Portsmouth to Durham to Dover to everywhere who have very active uh, tree committees and organizations. And ours is probably one of the newer, smaller ones, but we're getting there. Um, Matt will be happy to know that Greg Jordan's on our committee, so he's been helping me out. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a rundown, and I think uh, there's a bit of a, a loop of some slides that uh, Bob Glowacki is going to pop on there somehow. So I don't know where Bob is, but um, hopefully he'll, there they go. Um, so I'm Eileen Flockhart, and I'm chair of the Exeter Tree Committee. And our efforts here for, formally began in the summer of 2019 with a small group of tree lovers and our town tree warden, uh, Jay Perkins. And we began by focusing on doing Tree City USA, mostly for some guidance, and then hopefully for acceptance um, for the town. And as our group grew, we've added three arborists, our natural resources planner, the parks and rec director, um, and along with all of us, a dedicated to a tree-rich community. But I have to say, um, being a pretty neophyte, except I love trees, um, Having a group of people that show up at meetings with the amount of expertise that we've got um, makes meetings pretty amazing. And uh, people are just, someone will say, oh, can, is there any way that we could do this? And, you know, Greg will say, sure, I know this guy who does the big trees. Or Kevin Breen says, I can bring my get my crew over and we'll help plant the trees. And, you know, one thing has led to another to another. And um, it's just been an amazing experience. Um, in the middle of this, COVID provided us with some interesting challenges. Our uh, first big um, Arbor Day event uh, happened in the middle of COVID and we were not able to involve the kids at Lincoln Street School for their tree planted out by the playground, but the kids had written stories, had done artwork. We got the, uh, the bookstore in town to de dedicate a, a window in town to display all their information, and then it was videotaped, so it was online for everybody to enjoy, at least from a distance. Um, and so now we're officially a subcommittee of the Conservation Commission, and we have a space on that town website where people can access both pictures of what we've done and those videos and more information. Um, 
town support for our plantings happening happened, as you can see in the, in this picture, um, by just a lot of great cooperation. And someone said, "Oh well, we'll we'll agree to do all the tree planting for you." And so Jay Perkins and his crew, some folks at Public Works who really um, know their business when it comes to planting trees and taking care of them, uh, just jumped in and said, "That's we'll do all the tree planting when it comes to that. And uh, so they've been doing it up to this day. And then Parks and Rec decided um, they would jump in and help out. And they've been providing mulch and uh, tree diaper watering bag systems um, for all the new trees that we've planted. So it, it's just, just this great cooperative effort um, in town. And awareness has been growing in a lot of areas. As a, a local neighborhood organized uh, three memorial trees for Park Street Common. And once again, Public Works in the Rec Department and one of our arborists and crew did all the planting for these trees and the families got very involved and worked together to create a celebration. And we were able to do that outside when uh, some of the mask mandates were lifted. So that was a huge success. Um, so we've, we've also created um, with one of the arborists, Kevin Breen, to do some what we call tree walk and talks. And uh, we've done several of those around town, even through COVID. Um, and we've been able to film a couple of those and we're hoping to do some more so that you walk around, you hear about the tree, then you realize, oh, did you ever notice that that tree had cabling in it? We've been able to save that tree. This tree needs some pruning, this needs that. And so it's not just identifying trees or saying, isn't that wonderful, but learning a whole lot about what it takes to maintain um, the tree canopy that we have in town. Um, and uh, so we're also working locally with um, the town organizations and local nurseries so that when we go to select new plantings that we're looking for native species and hardy species and trying to do some diversity. But there was a, a survey done of you know what what are the most common trees in in the central area of the town, and of course you know every kind of maple in town was the winner. So we said you know it's time to plant something besides a maple tree. But I, I love maple trees. It's okay. But uh, so but we wanted people when we did when we began all this work to really recognize both the aesthetic and the ecological and even the economic importance of trees to, to the fabric of our town. When you drive into town, what do you see? Do you see blacktop or do you see trees? And so if it was up to me, I'd get out a jackhammer and get rid of all the blacktop and plant green. But uh, bit by bit, we'll try to get there. Um, we're working to increase our connections to uh, school children. And we began with Lincoln Street School, who has a green team, a terrific bunch of kids. And they were involved in the first Arbor Day with us. And we're now helping them to create a, a pollinator garden, which has been built and the loam has been donated but by one of our committee members. And so the kids will be planting a pollinator garden this spring out front of school. Um, and we are doing some connections to the uh, Seacoast School of Technology. And they're gonna create a book of 25 uh, most native trees uh, so that people can have some access to some choices. And, uh, and then coming very soon, in another, another week or two, we hope to involve all the elementary students in this champion tree scavenger hunt. Uh, we're gonna introduce kids to the concept of what is a champion tree, but mostly we want them to get out and find big trees, learn about the trees, um, 
right away this little green team meeting the other day kids were saying oh no i know this tree it's in the woods where we go i know just where it is and so you know they're going to take a picture of it note where they found it get as much detail as they can about it and so it's just another way for them to connect with the trees that are around them um so Another not as exciting project that we've been working on, but a very necessary one has been creating a town tree ordinance. Um, we'd never really had one and we desperately needed something to guide, to guide us. And we began with just an ordinance that would involve public trees and park trees. Um, someday we'll work on getting trees in private lands too. But at this point, we, we figured we'd start with this and um, we managed to get it uh, accepted by the select board after three hearings just this past November. And we're able to submit that with our um, Tree City USA uh, application this year. So we've been able to qualify for Tree City USA for the third year in a row. So we're pleased about that. And uh, so keep an eye out in town. There's two nice Tree City signs and a, and a flag. And I guess we get a new flag, so that'll be fun. Um, we've also, in addition, when we realized uh, with the tree ordinance, we wanted to have a way for people if they wanted to uh, have a memorial tree planted somewhere in town. We needed a format or a way to do that and uh, maybe a, a funding system that would create a, a rollover kind of um, source for us to use uh, going forward to purchase uh, trees as needed. Uh, so that got set up by the Parks and Rec uh, director who's on our committee as well. And um, so um, in May, we're going to have an alewife festival. If you're not familiar with alewives, they're, they're Exeter's very own fish, mostly lobster bait, but they, they come up now that the dam has been blown out of there, they come up the river, which is an estuary. And um, so on May 14th, there'll be an alewife festival. We'll have a, a tree committee table set up, but mostly we're going to celebrate the kids um, when they bring us their champion big tree um, results. And we'll be giving out some, some valuable prizes, I'm sure. I don't know what they'll be, but they'll, they'll be something fun. Um, but so these past two years, have certainly taught us the reliance on nature to soothe our worries and our grief. When we needed calm, we went outside to walk along our river, along Swayze Parkway, in cemeteries and other parks for respite from so many fears. We didn't need a pandemic to tell us how soothing our trees and parks could be. Now we know it more clearly than ever. We look at each of these spaces carefully and know we must protect and expand the gift that our tree cover provides. That's the mission of our committee. We look forward to planting many more trees and learning and caring about those that we have. Please visit the Conservation Commission website and click on the tree committee to learn more about what we've done and what we hope to do. Thanks very much. Very well done, thank you. We appreciate it very much. Welcome. And, and so that, that concludes our third and final session. Um, but these sessions are rebroadcast on uh, Comcast Cable 98, Channel 98, and Comcast Channel 13, the education channel. So if you look on the town website, you will find the broadcast schedules um, for these programs, the three that we've gone through. And um, you, know, you can tell your friends about it and share it um, in the neighborhood. So thanks for watching. Appreciate your expertise, Professor Rock. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good evening. And we'll hope things get better in, uh, in um, your Ukraine.
Thank you.